Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video view series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the DM's Guild character class, The Consort, designed by Jackson Lewis for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your DMs Guild shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons Andrew, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Nick, Andy, Chris, Manuel, Basil, and Nick, and Gold Patrons RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marco Stade, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, A.K., Cert2, B, Adam, Dead, Lizard, Lounge, Sam, Aras, Lumpy Spuds, and Jerome. Thank you all very much for your support. So, the Fey is something that I think hasn't been explored very much in D&D, and I've seen quite a few products from the DMs Guild that does explore it. I was kind of hoping we'd get some new Fey material in the form of an actual, you know, campaign adventure or something. But in the meantime, we've got some wonderful new uh, character classes. This one is a single class called the Consort, which is kind of a hybrid of Paladin, Warlock, and Bard. And it's, it feels very powerful, at least for the most part. The kind of top-end abilities uh, I was less excited about. It does come with its own um, subclasses, I guess. They are the Fey Presences, or the Patrons, I guess. Uh, there's four of them, which is nice. They kind of pigeonhole you into a certain build, which is a bit of a bummer. And I, I'm, I'm generally pretty positive on this class. It, it plays things pretty safe. It's you know it feels very similar to if it, literally if you combined a paladin, if you took a paladin, gave them the bard spell list, and then added warlock style invocations, that's basically the consort, which feels really powerful. I mean, and it, and it and on paper it seems pretty strong. So those are all great features of all of those classes. Um, I guess technically saying the bard spells is going too far because you still only have the uh, up till fifth level spells uh levels and the way the rate at which they gain spells is similar to what a paladin and ranger does and not what a bard does because a bard in fifth edition is actually a full spellcaster the consort is not but the actual spells you get are much more like a bards uh specifically than a paladin or a ranger it's very professionally done the layout looks uh very nice the cover art is oddly kind of weird low resolution here i'm not sure what happened there but the consort is, I mean, first of all, a consort usually is used for somebody who's romantically involved with a noble. Uh, and it, it does mention that, like, hey, that, you know, romance and actual sexual relationship doesn't have to play into this class. And obviously, talk to your players if they even are thinking of having that be a thing. Maybe we could have used this, you know, a different terminology than consort, because to me, that's kind of inexorably tied to uh how like that that's the word you use if that's a certain kind of romantic relationship um but i don't know if i don't know what other term there's gonna be a cool term for fairy warrior or something but somebody who is thematically tied to the fae is what this consort is uh primarily and it's you get a d10 so you're you could be strength or dex you're a frontline fighter but then you've got the spell so again think uh specifically paladin you've got the fighting style at second level Archery, dueling, great weapon. A new one is primitive weapon fighting, which uh, has to do with throwing weapons. And it just says you can draw another weapon with the thrown property as part of the same attack. Does that mean you also, you're throwing it or you're just drawing it? Which I never gave a crap about, you know, keeping up with my players, how many times they can draw whatever weapons and do all that. Nobody's been that kind of crazy about it in my games anyway, so I'm not sure if that even needs to be a thing, but that's apparently part of it. But, you know, the stuff that's tied thematically to... Somebody who's associated with the Fey Realm would be, you know, you have, like, resistance to charm, uh, and you are charming with other people. They typically have very high uh, charisma. They can mess with people via their mind. You're typically good against spells, but maybe you'd have weaknesses against metal, although I don't think that's actually uh, mentioned anywhere. Uh, and then you gain, at first level, as a consort, you get to choose your Fey Sovereign, which is pretty much exactly how the Warlock Patron works. You have to literally pick the person who is bestowing upon you these powers. And you have four choices. You've got the Summer Queen, Queen uh, Tichiana, the Winter Queen, Queen Mob, uh, some figure called the Earl King, and another figure called the... I think I remember how to pronounce uh, fairy stuff, the Lenenshi. 
think that's Leanne and she, something like that. <laughs> I think I know this is the the S I D H E is she because that's where the band she uh, comes from. That's a that's a whole Celtic. And you know, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Like I said, that we should get a whole supplement and a whole story involving the Faerun. There's a, like a lot of the monsters come, you know, that are that we think of as traditional fantasy monsters, like trolls and and gremlins and all that. Those those come from literal fairy tales. <laughs> so. The main issue I have with this class is that each of these patrons is it, it, it kind of pigeonholes you into a certain play style. So one thing I like about how the paladin works is that no matter which of the paladin oaths that you are devoted to, or you swear allegiance to, or whatever, you gain specific spells that are thematically tied to that devotion. And keep in mind, there is an archfey paladin already, uh, which is already like a fey themed paladin. You, all, you get those specific spells, and then you get specific abilities, and usually like an auras, that all are just themed that way. So you kind of have the same things, or just uh, re-themed to make it so it makes sense for that kind of oath. This one instead makes them a lot different, and in doing so, kind of makes it so if you want to play this class in a certain direction, because it's a very versatile class, then you would choose that consort, rather than it being something that you might want to do from the story, from a role-playing standpoint. So, for example, the Summer Queen is all about more uh, martial forces. You you gain you gain proficiency with shields, and you get an extra D4 as you can light your sword uh, on fire. So, automatically, you're thinking, okay, this is for the frontline fighter. And then for the Winter Queen, as you can see here, you get a whole bunch of like wizard spells: Vampiric Touch, Fire Shield, Ice Storm, Cone of Cold, Armor of Agathis. You know, and it's cool. There's a lot of uh, cold spells, um, and you get like you can do bonus things with uh, with uh, cold damage whenever you're doing. But what if I wanted to play, you know, a fire themed spellcaster who who followed the summer court? That's not an option. It's it's just weird the way it was done that way. I would have really liked to see it. You know, here's the spell list for this patron. Here's the spell list for this patron, and so on. And then here's the other things. And I realize at that point, I'm I'm asking. It's weird because I'm asking to copy more of what the Paladin does, and that would almost make it a different kind of complaint if it followed the Paladin too closely. But what it does here is it makes them so different that if I'm going to be like a pure... If I'm going to take this class and make it into more of a spellcaster, then I should take this way. But, you know, what if I wanted to wield a sword and do extra cold damage? You know, that's just not an option for whatever weird reason, and I feel like it, it could have been. The other two, the Urkling, is all about range damage. So uh, you're you're dealing uh, bonuses with uh, any arrows that you shoot. There's a really interesting ability here, which something I have not seen a whole lot of classes do is manipulate initiative, which I think is a really interesting uh, thing that you you know by what, still keeping a class for doing something in combat, but that's kind of a, a unique you know time manipulation thing. But I don't like the implementation here. It says. It's called Ambush, and it's all about using your predatory instincts because you're this is the hunter fey. Uh, but it says when you roll initiative, you can choose a friendly creature within 30 feet and swap initiatives with them if they're lower. But that means you're screwing another player over by swapping your initiative with them. It didn't even say they, they give you that consent to do it. So that's very bizarre to even bring that up. You would be, I mean, players would freaking hate you to do that. And what is that to do with ambushing somebody? You're just, instead, you're like skipping time with a partner or something. So I think a, a cooler way of of making that ability uh, make sense would be if if somebody rolled an initiative within maybe like five of you or something, then you could use this ability. And it says you can use it uh, twice between long rests. You, you know, come up whatever balance you want. And then you can still go before them, you know, maybe once during the first round or so you know you, there's some way of doing it but make it so it has to do with the enemy's initiative and not an allies one and especially not swapping with them so i didn't like i, I like the idea of manipulating initiative but i don't like how that was actually implemented um and then the lianen uh has the uh back to the blade ability and the hexblade warlock so you can actually summon your uh weapon uh or shunt it away or whatever and use your charisma for attacks and damage rolls that's a huge advantage and and pigeonholes you into, okay, I'm going to be, you know, using my weapons and I'm going to be a martial fighter. And you can also create this, like, clone of yourself, which is bizarre how it's balanced this way. It has a number of hit points equal to the level of the spell slot you expend. So, it has one hit point if you use a first level spell slot, and six hit points if you use a sixth level spell slot. I'm never going to use more than a first level spell slot then and just, you know, 
the DM and maybe just cost them an attack one time. It's, that's bizarre. There should have been some kind of multiplication or something because I would never spend more than a first level spell slot on it. But then you can fire spells from it. That's the only uh, advantage. Later on, I think you get um, proficiency and wisdom saves as long as you've got your uh, effigy active within 10 feet. So this one at least has more interesting, unique abilities. But I still wish they would have at least added the um, specific spells to each of these. I think that would have helped uh, kind of theme them closer to whatever the patrons are. You know, I like the little descriptions about who these different patrons are. I, it, I only knew really the Summer Queen and the Winter Queen. I'm not up on my fairy lore too much. Wizards, again, give us that give us that Faerun book. Um, but I, I wish there was a little bit... I wish it hadn't pigeonholed each one of them into such a unique quality, although I, I don't mind the one that gives you the unique weapon and the the weird kind of clone thing, but the rest of them, basically, are do you want to be a frontline fighter, do you want to be a spellcaster, or do you want to be a ranger? Because this class is so, almost too versatile. I mean, you get a D10, you know, you, you've got, which I'll go over that in a second, you've got the Warlock Invocations, they're called Tributes here, and some of them are quite powerful. You've got, I think, better spells than either a Paladin or a Ranger. Granted, you still only have, you know, up to 5th level spell slots, but still... The only thing that really... And you've got your fighting styles. You've got extra attack. The only thing that seems a little bit tuned um, downward is the higher level abilities aren't terribly impressive. At 15th level, you stop aging. Does any player actually care about this? Like, I get that... Grant, uh, D&D is a combat simulator. Like, let's face it. Like, everything has to do with combat. Like, yes, we like to role play. We like to explore. But when it comes down to it, you know, most of the abilities have to do with combat or, you know, skill checks or something out. How often does that come up where you care about not aging? I don't know. That's a bizarre thing to me, to make that like a class ability. Um, and then you get uh, you get a you can use your reaction to succeed against banishment or plane shift while in the Feywild. Okay, that's I'm sure that's going to come up quite a bit in your campaign. That's 15th level. 18th level, you automatically know if somebody's lying. I mean, you could roll a really good insight check. Also, uh, you can cast minor illusion to disguise self at will. Also doesn't seem very impressive. At level 20, you can up your charisma score to 22, and you're immune to charm. None of those abilities were very impressive. So maybe that's to help balance out the fact that it seems like a very powerfully versatile class. Like, I don't see any reason to go above uh, 14th level in it, though. Uh, so the tributes, we get 20 of them, which is pretty impressive. And these, again, are similar to the Warlock Invocations. Some of the abilities you get are uh, you can add a swimming speed. You can gain uh, new spells, kind of similar to the Warlock, where you just gain those spells, um, usually like per long rest, instead of spending a spell slot. You can gain True Sight, you can gain additional attacks. Um, probably the craziest one is this Trollish Durability, where you can gain resistance to bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing damage from non-magical weapons. And you can take it up to three times to gain resistance in all of those. Oh, uh, no, I would not allow that. Yikes. Uh, you're permanently a barbarian raging all the time, and you get three tributes at level three. So potentially, you could have resistance to bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing from non-magical weapons at third level. That's, I mean, that, that gives you a lot less of the some of the other cool abilities, but, like, holy crap, that seems incredibly powerful. Now, at the very... I mean... I might take away that completely, but at the very least, I would limit that to once. You you can you can take that one damn time. You cannot take it. It literally says you can take the tribute three times using a different type. Hell no, that is way too much. Um, and some of them do have you know level prerequisites that are pretty powerful, and they seem pretty neat. And they all are tied to the different uh, the different uh, fey patrons at, at 18th level. It's like a kind of a, a cool capstone ability, which which is neat. That that part's kind of cool, and that makes it maybe more worth you know leveling up that high, but. Trollish durability, that at least needed prerequisites. It at least needed a prerequisite if you're going to take it multiple times. Like, the first one, the first time you can take it at maybe 5th level, and then the second time, maybe at, like, 12th level, and then the third time at, like, 18th level or something. So I, I would need a little bit of a balance pass there. But I, I do, I love Warlock Invocations as an idea, as a, as a shopping list of abilities that you can pick and choose as you level up. I think it's a cool concept. So I, I like the idea that it's basically copied over here. It seems like they're all decently pulled from different fey creatures. Hide of the Displacer Beast, Strength of Old Winter, Hag's Eye. You know, that feels pretty cool, and that can kind of add to your character story. So I'm, I'm generally pretty positive on them, even if that Trollish durability makes me go, whoa, a little too much. 
And finally, we get new a few new spells and some themed magic weapons. Uh, as you can see, the spell list, it's kind of odd the way it's all kind of crunched up in the corner here. It's such an important part of the character because you have a very specific uh, spell list to choose from. And at a glance, it looked very similar to the Bard. You've got Cure Wounds, Protection for Evil and Good, Shield. I guess a lot of that is uh, Paladin, though, too. Uh, Expeditious Retreat, Entangle, Cause Fear, Second Level, Darkness, Hold Person, uh, Silence, Crown of Madness. It's a whole lot of, you know, support stuff for the most part. Thunder Step, Speak with Plants, Phantom Steed, that part's Paladin. Bestokers, Cold Snap. So there's some new spells, five new ones here. Mists of Avalon is a cool Misty Step you can cast as a reaction. Wild Hunt, which is very thematically appropriate to the Fae. Uh, you can literally summon, like, a fairy hound to just track a monster. That seems pretty cool. Cold Snap at third level, you can do 8d6 cold damage. Uh, I thought that was only reserved for Fireball, and that got grandfathered in because it's insanely powerful. However, I do like the restriction that it has to radiate out of you in a 20-foot radius. So unlike Fireball, you don't get to pick and choose where it explodes. It's just coming out of you. But that's still a pretty damn good amount of damage for uh, third level. Uh, magic weapons, no complaints there. They're all... Uh, uh, there's a shield and a ring, so they're actually not all technically weapons. I do like the uh, hammer that's a... As a bonus action, you can uh, throw the hammer, and then you have to make a charisma check to actually get it back, which I think is a cool way of, like, exerting your willpower and maybe trying to be, like, Thor-worthy to make the hammer actually go back into your hand. So I thought that was a neat little addendum like there. I, I love magic weapons that give players options on like how to use them or when to use them and also add like additional things instead of it just being uh, this makes you you know this much stronger so i thought that was kind of nice all right and that's it so let's go over my pros and cons for the consort pros four fey patron options i always like having my uh, subclasses and they seem like they're all very thematically tied to different uh, all the different fey uh, kings and queens i guess i'm not i need to read up on my fey court Pros, 20 invocation-like tributes. I'm a big fan of invocations, and I like the tributes here. And pros, 5 new spells and 8 magic weapons. My only con is that each of the each of those fey patrons is it almost like you choose like how you want to play, and then you're kind of locked into that, and you're also locked into that patron. It's just a weird way of balancing... You know, if you want to be a fighter, you're going to choose basically Queen Titiana or maybe Lian and Shi. And if you're going to be a ranger, go Urkling. If you're going to be a uh, spellcaster, then go Queen Mob. So I, I wish, you know, I like having the four choices. I just wish it would have been set up a little bit to where you still maintain the versatility that the versatility of the class wants you to have, uh, but still be able to choose, pick and choose whichever fate patron you want. Uh, without feeling the need to kind of choose right at level one, okay, I guess I'm going to play it in this play style because I'm choosing this certain patron. Uh, final verdict, the consort is a thematically satisfying hybrid of paladin, bard, and warlock, though a bit too versatile for its own good. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson, and you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.